Good morning, I'm Mabel Jong, and you're watching day one of the World Healthcare Congress coverage here at the World Healthcare Congress Interview Zone. I'm so pleased to have with me now Nate Holobinko, who is principal at the Boston Consulting Group. Good morning, Nate. How are you today? Great morning, Mabel. It's so great to be here. Well, thank you. We are so um, interested to know about the report that you're putting out that will really talk about some of the numbers of people that would enroll when the Accountable Care Act was first passed. We've fallen short of those initial predictions. Why is that? Well, it's a, a great question, one that's getting a lot of attention right now. And I think to understand what happened, you have to go back and look where the country was and where people's minds were back in 2010. And really the analog that folks had to go by was the Massachusetts health reform law, which was passed several years earlier and was really the, the basic architecture upon which the national bill was modeled. Um, and at that point in time, people were expecting two things. One, they were expecting, like the Massachusetts law, a number of people that were previously uninsured would come into the marketplace and that would make up part of the enrollment. Uh, they were also expecting this interesting effect that they didn't see in Massachusetts, which is something called employer dumping, where mm -hmm. employers would essentially take their employees, whom they previously directly purchased insurance for, and essentially give them a stipend or send them out to the market to, to buy for themselves. Uh, interestingly, it's primarily the second effect, which is why we've fallen short, because uh, as employers actually got a little bit uh, more into detail and under the numbers, they found that the economics of doing that didn't make as much sense as they superficially thought. The other thing which really drove this effect is, if you look back at that individual side, the nation as a whole didn't really behave the way that Massachusetts did. Uh, and part of why so many people signed up in Massachusetts is that the state really uh, fostered or sponsored this idea of individual responsibility or social responsibility in signing up for insurance. And it was actually that social responsibility as opposed to the penalties which really drove folks. Um, probably no surprise to you nationwide, we haven't really had that same level of alignment uh, or push and as a result, uh, many folks, particularly in states where ACA has become you know, politically untouchable, have opted not to enroll in, in the same manner. And so really those two effects uh, have combined to, to drive enrollment much shorter than you know, some of the optimistic numbers back to the early days. Okay, so given that we know what the reality is, how should both the payers and payees move forward in this environment where the numbers really tell a different story? I, I think it, it boils down to a couple things. One is just going back to that employer market. And whereas over the past several years, I think folks have looked at that market as a bit of a dog, something that might go away, something that might erode, really think about that as more of a foundational market that's actually here to stay, something, uh, something that can thrive and actually grow over time. I think employers are increasingly seeing that uh, in order to remain competitive to their employees, as you have companies like Alphabet and Apple that are out there really offering these rich benefits that they're going to need to continue to offer competitive insurance. It's something that you know, we all, as we think about the jobs that we want, uh, we, we look for that in, in our employment. Uh, and so I think insurance companies in turn need to continue to foster that segment and see it as a core part of their business. Uh, I think counter to that, uh, insurance companies are gonna take a much higher level of scrutiny towards the individual market. Not only is it not as big as many folks thought it was going to be, but it's also been uh, a particularly dangerous place to play. Uh, the, the risk adjustment mechanisms, these mechanisms the government put in place uh, to try to make that more economically stable haven't really played out the way that people were hoping and a lot of companies have lost a lot of money. And so I think you're gonna see a, 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 a environment where uh, insurance companies really ask themselves, is this something I'm good at? Is this a space that I should play in? And the ones that can answer that yes, and it becomes part of their business may double down in that space. Others that really don't have that capability to play or don't see the advantage of it may back out or even exit completely from that market. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is your advice to some of your clients now? Um, you offered some pretty interesting thoughts. If you are successful, you should go for it and really even work more harder to get the business in that area. And for those who aren't showing success, they should opt out. So what is your primary message uh, other than that to your clients? I think there's a couple things. Obviously those individual and employer market trends are, are two of the bigger trends going on in the industry and uh, payers in particular need to give careful attention to, to where and how they participate. 
But I think more broadly than that, payers really need to consider the broader spectrum of where their earnings are going to be, where their profits are going to come from in the future. Uh, the government profit pools, particularly Medicare Advantage and Medicaid, are two pools which will be difficult to compete in, but are going to grow quite a bit as boomers continue to age, as the market continues to shift away from fee-for-service Medicare to Medicare Advantage, um, as I think you'll see more red states opting to participate in Medicaid over the next several years, that's also going to be a market where pairs will increasingly want to play. Again, if they have the capabilities to do that, those are, those are very difficult markets to compete in. Well, and finally, going back to that, how much consideration should put, be put towards the political concerns or, or aspect of this sector, for this sector? I, I, I think it's one that uh, payers would be wise to consider thoughtfully. Uh, you can't simply march into these markets and assume that the status quo of today will perpetuate or continue in the future. I think being pragmatic, you have to recognize this is a political space. It's highly regulated and what happens in the next several years could really shift the direction one way or other. Um, that said, I think if you're looking at this space, you have to take some uh, estimated or, or uh, calculated bets to say, you know, where do the indicators think the space is likely to go or suggest the space is likely to go? And then based on that, you know, where can we make some fairly safe bets about these are segments where we are uh, capable of competing and where the market is likely to be? Okay. Have I missed anything, Nate, that you'd like to mention today? I think the only other thing that I'd want to punctuate is there's a, a pretty interesting trend probably of all the predictions that have been made that it has the most legs around this greater involvement between payers and providers, this clinical collaboration. And I think this is something that the fundamental economics are just going to continue to, uh, to drive going forward. Uh, as the market gets more price sensitive, both on the employer side and on the individual and government sides, mm -hmm. uh, payers and providers are really recognizing it's no longer an I win, you lose situation, uh, but really by looking at the economics together, they can actually drive down the total cost of, of managing care for the population and actually harvest those benefits for mutual gain across the parties. Okay, excellent. Nate Holobinko, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Great, thanks so much for having me. And I'm Mabel Jong. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned.